really been looking forward to this, and I'm especially honored that the President Emeritus of the Disciples of Christ Historical Society um, and uh, Peter Morgan and his wife Lynn, who are great friends of the Society, are here um, to cheer me on. <laughs> Peter has, has assured he's not sitting out front to throw tomatoes at me. So. <laughs> Um, I'd like for us to consider uh, today uh, some verses from uh, the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. Um, I'm going to take a pretty roundabout route uh, to get there, but stick with me. We'll eventually uh, enter the promised land, so just, you know, be patient uh, with me. I'll, I'll start by reading... Uh, these, uh, these verses from Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God, they will be God's peoples, and God will be with them. I want to talk today about tabernacles and presence. Tabernacle was not just this great uh, uh, facility that you had here at Crystal Lake for uh, many years. It was the tent of meeting where Israel gathered for worship long before there was a big majestic temple in the royal capital of Jerusalem. It was the place in the wilderness between slavery in Egypt and settlement in the promised land, where Israel wandered and where God wandered with them, camping, meeting, eating, sharing in one another's presence. But tabernacle is also a metaphor that the Christian visionary John of Patmos used in a letter he wrote a few years after Jesus was crucified to the churches along the coast of the modern nation of Turkey. That letter is now part of our Christian Bible, and we call it the Book of Revelation. Um, I want to start our tabernacle journey by telling a story from my own family history. Uh, some of you who've heard me speak before may have uh, heard this story, but it's a doggone good story and you can stand to hear it again. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is a true story that has the added benefit of having actually happened. Um, this is a story about my maternal grandmother's family. My great-grandfather, Pa Bandy, and my great-great-uncle Jack were Tennessee moonshiners. Now, I'm not lifting this up as a role model. Moonshine is bad for you, and moonshining was and is illegal, so don't do it. But it was hard work. It was good money and they didn't pay taxes. They were living the American dream. <laughs> My family's stories growing up were about outsmarting G-men and revenuers, about jailbreaks and hideouts and living under false identities in Arkansas. All of this, by the way, much to my grandmother's chagrin. She nearly died of embarrassment every time one of these stories was told, though that didn't keep her from jumping in with numerous corrections of historical detail. It may be humiliating, but let's at least get the story right. <laughs> this is one of our family's most important stories. It seems that a family just across the state line in Kentucky had a business dispute with my people. You see, Bandy Whiskey was known throughout Middle Tennessee and Southern Kentucky and 
thanks to World War II military maneuvers in those parts, Bandy Whiskey was known nationwide as the safest and purest and best corn whiskey money could buy. It was outstanding moonshine, or so I've been told. <laughs> and in any fair competition, the Bandies were just going to have a major share of the market. They were sort of the Microsoft or the Apple computers of moonshine whiskey in the middle part of the 20th century. Now the problem was that these bandy wannabes from Kentucky had their own, and in all honesty, lower quality whiskey operation. <laughs> they were of the opinion that the bandies had an unfair market advantage, so they filed the moonshiners version of an antitrust suit. They started taking pot shots at the bandy's stashes and stills. Then one day my family got word that these people were coming down from Kentucky to finish us off once and for all. Well, what were my people to do? Pa Bandy convened a family meeting, a kind of regional assembly. <laughs> and when he laid out his plan, they all knew it's what they had to do. It was the only thing that would settle this feud once and for all. The men took off through the woods with their guns. Granny Bandy, Aunt Betty, and my grandmother, Addie Mae, fired up the coal stove and started to cook. Yeah. Fried chicken, fresh green beans, fried corn, fried green tomatoes, lots of fried stuff. <laughs> Sliced red tomatoes and cucumbers, boiled potatoes, boiled cabbage and greens, cornbread, coleslaw, chicken gravy. They baked pecan pie with Pa Bandy's thick golden molasses, a nice byproduct of the main operation. <laughs> they made chocolate pie and lemon pie with big fluffy meringue. They boiled coffee and sassafras tea and iced tea. And they pulled a jug of sweet milk up out of the water well where they kept it nice and cold. And they put it in the ice box next to the fresh buttermilk that was already there. Pa, Uncle Jap, and the boys got to jump on their enemy and three of his sons underneath that big chestnut tree. This, my grandmother thought that was really important that we remember that. <laughs> As they tried to maneuver their Model A between the deep ruts that the rainwater had cut through Bandy Holler Road. At gunpoint, they marched their captives across the creek, through the woods, down the holler, up over the hill, up to the Bandy farmhouse. Pa Bandy invited them to sit at the picnic table Granny Bandy and the women had set up in the front yard. Maybe it was the rustic setting. Perhaps it was the sound of the babbling brook, the sight of a beautiful banquet spread, or the joy of an unexpected invitation to dine. Or maybe it was the seven shotguns pointed at <laughs> For whatever reason, the bandies decided that they would accept, or, 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 or the, these men decided they would accept bandy hospitality that day. Quietly they sat, quietly they ate, while the bandy boys stood behind them, guns pointed and cocked. When they finished eating, the men stood and with resignation extended hands to their kidnappers. They knew they had been beaten, outwitted, outmaneuvered by the bandits. The feud was over. There was nothing else they could do. The moral code of the Scots-Irish Cherokee Hill culture was clear and irrefutable on this point. When you share a meal at somebody's home, 
when you sit at their dinner table and eat their food, you are forever barred from harming them. Like it or not, from now on, you're kind of like family. My people had ended the feud. At the dinner table, they had neutralized their enemies. The war was over. The men who had come as enemy prisoners to the table by sharing the meal offered there left as friends. Curse those bandies. <laughs> now, Pa Bandy concocted his plan based on the assumption that the neighbors would share the moral code of hospitality that would make all this work. And it, it was a good assumption. I mean, I remember my mom once was doing an oral history project for a college class she was taking, and she interviewed Uncle Jack, and she said, Uncle Jack, how did, how did you know that would work? And he said, it's the code. It's the code. The truth is that through many human cultures, through most of human history, people have adhered to some version or another of just such a moral code of hospitality. It's not really operating in modern capitalist America, uh, but in most human cultures through most hum uh, of human history, uh, it has. And hospitality codes were alive and well in biblical times. They were rooted in the economic systems that governed life in the ancient world. For the most part, people lived in extended families of 10 to 15 people on family farms in regions that were inhabited by kinfolks, cousins, uncles, aunts, etc. Everybody within the family was responsible for the economic well-being and long-term survival of the family. And families in the region were responsible for the welfare of each other. Your survival literally depended on these networks of family relationships, these networks of mutual support. But you know, what if you found yourself on the move? What if you found yourself cut off from your family network? What if drought or blight or simple trade? What if climate change or too many people and not enough land? What if war or invasion or social upheaval forced you to leave your ancestral property, your kinship network, and migrate somewhere else? What if you found yourself cut off from the family-based system of economic support that normally would sustain you? Or let's flip that around. What if you found yourself confronted in your own backyard with other families that were on the move? Strangers cut off from their systems of economic support, now coming into your territory, vulnerable, needy, hungry. I mean, remember the warning of that great prophet, Bob Marley. A hungry man is an angry man. Strangers in the neighborhood may pose a threat. Desperate people sometimes take desperate measures. If they're hungry enough, they may just well take from you what they think they need to survive. So what should you do about strangers who come for a while, or maybe forever, into your land? Well, that's where hospitality codes come into play. The way you deal with the potential danger posed by strangers in your midst is to make them temporary family to offer them a place at your table. <clears throat> if they accept your invitation and they sit at your table and eat your food, they are agreeing, in effect, to be part of your family for the time that they're in your territory. And to work, as all family members are obliged to, for the survival of your family. At the table, the people who might be enemies become friends. 
a community of mutual support. They become family. Genesis 18, the famous encounter at the Oaks of Mamre between Abraham and Sarah and God and the angels, illustrates the process of hospitality. As the story begins, Abraham is standing at the entrance to the family tent, literally on the boundary between the potentially hostile outside world and the safety of the domicile. He sees three men walking toward his home. As the senior male, the one most responsible for the safety of the family, Abraham runs out a safe distance from the tent to meet the strangers. Are they enemies or potential allies? That question will be answered through the artful dance of hospitality. Abraham bows and addresses the three strangers as if they are his superiors. He invites them to join his family for rest and sustenance. My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so you can wash your feet and rest yourselves under this tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourself. And after that, you can pass on. Their response to his invitation will determine whether Abraham needs to prepare a celebration or sound the alarm. Do as you have said, they said. <laughs> and in typical fashion for hospitality-based cultures, Abraham and Sarah respond with a lavish banquet, three days' worth of bread and pastries, a fatted calf slaughtered, which was a truly extravagant gesture in a society where cattle were basically the family insurance against crop failure. Just as we might be very careful about cashing in our pension or ra uh, raiding the rainy day fund, ancient Israelites rarely ate meat, much less meat from young animals. And yet Abraham slaughtered a well-fed calf to prepare a feast for these strangers who had accepted his offer of hospitality. Such extravagance was partly celebration. I mean, you know, thank God you decided to sit at my table rather than slaughter my family and take all of our possessions. And it was partly, well, honestly, kind of why. See how generous we can be <laughs> to those who work with us and not against us? So hospitality had a very practical function for the mutual protection of families when people were on the move. But hospitality also came into play in the complex relationship between the human world and the divine. This is especially evident in the practice of ritual sacrifice. <coughs> Many of us, particularly in the Christian tradition, tend to think of sacrifice, particularly animal sacrifice, as a kind of um, appeasement. You know, God is angry because of some kind of human infraction, so somebody's got to die. Blood must be shed to satisfy the wrath of the deity. We're trying our best to avoid shedding human blood, so we substitute an animal hoping that this sacrifice will appease the deity and get him or her off our backs. But this is a misunderstanding of what normally is going on in ancient sacrifice. It's not so much about appeasement as it is about hospitality, about sharing a table with the somewhat strange, potentially dangerous other. In this case, about as radically strange and other as you can possibly get. I mean, this is God that we're talking about. The sacrificial system is a way for the people to have dinner with God. To keep the divine human relationship solidly intact. 
Listen to this passage from Numbers chapter 4. The topic is packing up the tabernacle, which is what I am talking to you about. Today. Um, the tabernacle, this movable tent where God was understood to be especially present with Israel as they wandered through the wilderness between Egypt and Canaan, between slavery and freedom, between despair and hope. In other words, where faithful people uh, always seem to be find, finding themselves uh, schlogging around. Quote, when the camp is ready to set out, Aaron and his sons will go in and take down the screening curtain. They'll cover the Ark of the Covenant with it. Then they'll put on a covering of fine leather and spread a blue cloth over that and put its carrying poles in place. Over the table of the bread of the presence, which is the long table that sat in front of God's chair, they will spread a blue cloth and put the plates, the dishes, the bowls, the flagons for the drink offering on top of the cloth. The regular bread offering will also be on it. They'll put a crimson cloth over the whole thing and put its carrying poles in place. They'll cover the lampstand with its lamps, snuffers, trays, and oil vessels with a blue cloth. They'll take all the service utensils, the fire pans, the forks, the basins, all the utensils of the altar, cover them with leather, and put the carrying poles in place. And then the Kohathites, who are basically priestly kitchen staff, will come in and carry them out without, of course, touching any of the utensils with dirty hands. Yes, the tabernacle is a religious shrine, but what the text here describes is basically a dining room. The tabernacle that's being loaded up here for transport is the mess hall. They're wrapping the china and the pots and the pans and the silverware and they're packing them in dish boxes for the move. What happened at the tabernacle altar was not bloody appeasement for a wrathful God. It was sharing a meal with one who could be a threat, but who at the table becomes family and friend. This ongoing act of hospitality, of fellowship around the table, bound God to the people and the people to God. And of course, as we would expect in ancient hospitality cultures, the meal was lavish. The choicest of meats, the finest wines, bread and cakes and grains in abundance, all prepared by the White House chef. It just made sense to have a regular dinner date with God, to keep the Almighty at the table. And you know, it's really not good to have your invitation to the table decline. You don't want to get a note like this one from God's messenger, Amos, to Israel. <laughs> I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no pleasure in your assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'm not going to accept them. Offerings of well-fed beef, I'm not going to pay attention. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. You don't want to get a note like this sent through God's messenger Isaiah. I am sick of your lavish offerings. I've had my fill of your lamb and beef and goat. I hate your feasts. I'm tired of them. When you spread your hands to me, I'll hide my eyes. When you pray to me, I will not listen. Because your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away your evil deeds. Quit doing evil. Learn what's right. 
Seek justice. Give relief to the oppressed. Support the orphan. Plead for the widow. You see, the thing about it is that the God of the Bible is a God of generosity and justice. The God of the Bible is the God who doesn't hoard power and sustenance, but rather spreads it around, shares it lavishly. The God of the Bible liberates slaves, cares for the vulnerable, feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, heals the sick. And if you want God to come to your dinner party, you better make sure that justice and generosity are on the menu. And I'm not talking about just little dainty bits of finger food portions, but big old humongous plates piled high with justice and passed around until everybody is just stuck. You see, when God shows up to dinner, nobody leaves hungry. This is the meaning of the tabernacle. The table spread with justice and generosity in the wilderness where God and the people meet. This, I think, is what John has in mind in Revelation 21. Now, John writes this letter from exile on the Isle of Patmos, off the coast of Turkey, and he intends it to be a circular a letter that will circulate among several uh, churches in several cities in the region. In the recent past, the churches have experienced persecution during the time of the Roman Emperor Nero, an especially arrogant, self-centered, and narcissistic leader who wanted to restore the greatness of the Roman Empire, even apparently to the point of burning the whole place down and starting over from scratch, if that's what it took. Now, a few years later, there seems to be a growing sense among the Christians of Asia Minor that a new round of persecution is about to begin. As a result, some are urging the churches to show their patriotism by praising the greatness of Caesar, even to the point of making a public show of support by making offerings down at the local Roman temples where Caesar and Roma, the personified uh, spirit of the city of Rome, were worshiped as deities. The argument of these people in the churches seems to have been this. We know that idols are nothing. There's only one God and Caesar is not it. So what harm can it do to show our patriotism, to stand at the Caesar altar, to sit at tables filled with offerings made to worship Caesar? What harm does it do to show, to pledge our allegiance to the cult of success and greed that Caesar promotes? We can kind of do it with our, our fingers crossed. You know, and nobody will be the wiser. John is appalled by this logic. He urges Christians to reject what he describes as idolatrous fornication, adultery, with the God of unquestioned patriotism to empire. The bizarre visions of dragons and beasts and mystical numbers like 666 which, by the way, is the product of a letter to number code used by Jewish mystics of John's day that if you apply that code, spells out the name Caesar Nero. <laughs> These bizarre visions portray the depressing, frightening political reality of the present times as in fact reflecting a larger spiritual struggle with cosmic consequences. The God of justice and generosity is even now, God, uh, John says, in the process of overcoming these forces of narcissistic, arrogant greed, wielding power. 
Though the political situation seems hopeless, John says, God is at work to bring about healing. God's justice will prevail. <clears throat> then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, John says. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be His peoples. And God uh, Himself will be with them. Now, in the original Greek, the words in this passage that are translated home and dwell are based on the same root word. The Greek word is skene, skene. It means tabernacle or tent. Remember in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelled among them for a while. It's the same word, skene. The Word became flesh and tabernacled, <laughs> camped among them for a while. See, the home, the tabernacle of God is among mortals. God will tabernacle, camp with them as their God. They will be God's peoples. And God will be with them. God is going to pitch tent. God is going to tabernacle. God is going to camp with the people. Meet them where they are. Journey with them. Journey with us. Through whatever wilderness of despair we may find ourselves in, God is sitting even now at a table spread with justice and generosity. God is present with us. God is camping with us. Amen. See, I am making all things new, God says. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. And as John envisions the new world God is bringing, the new Jerusalem, he sees that it has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal, God says. <laughs> he sees no temple in the city. John sees no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the rulers of earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. And John's vision concludes, quote, the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. And on either side of the river is the tree of life. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now what's so interesting about the language here? That the rulers of the earth will bring their glory into the gates of New Jerusalem where the tree of life grows whose leaves are for the healing of the nations is that earlier in the book of Revelation the rulers of the earth and the nations of the earth are explicitly condemned and punished. You know, thrown into the lake of fire. But condemnation and punishment in John's vision are not the final word. In this templeless 
walled city of Jerusalem, whose gates are always open by day and where night never comes because the ever-present God is its light, all the nations will enter and be healed. Clean and unclean, saint and sinner, nations and kings and governors and senators and presidents, all are invited to camp, to sit at the tabernacle table with God. No shotguns necessary or even allowed. At the table of justice, all are part of God's family. Brothers and sisters, by gracious mercy and love, God is calling us to the campground table where enemies become friends, where foes become family, at a table spread with generosity, justice, and love. Let's enter the gates, share the table, take from the fruit of the tree of life, and be whole and be healed. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.